thank you very, very much. It's a great joy and delight to be here. I'm thankful for this church. I've known so many people that have been part of the congregation here and students that have been students of Fuller here and students in Pasadena or other places. I've known pastors that have been formed here that were launched as uh, children who had grown up in the life of this church, who went on to seminary and then into ministry or, or mission service in various places, and just a lot of friends that have passed through in one way or another th through the life of this church. So it's a, a particularly great joy to be with you. This subject of, of fear is one that is a, a project that I've been working on for some time. And I came to it through, uh, through not an abstract interest in fear, but uh, first and foremost, I think simply through the fact that I realized at a certain stage, probably in my uh, early mid-20s, and I could certainly uh, say the same thing even now in my uh, later years, that, um, that fear is, is really one way that I could actually tell my whole story. If I went through every detail of who I am and what I've done and why I've done what I've done, it would be inescapable if I was telling the total truth to also uh, escape any way of not talking about fear. I would have to describe elements of fear that in various ways have shaped me. Now, that doesn't mean that my life has been defined by fear, but it has been affected by fear. And all of our lives are like that. And when you hear a topic like we're going to spend an evening thinking about fear, we don't begin to think in abstract philosophical terms. We immediately begin to think in physical terms because fear is in one sense, first and foremost, perhaps a biological reaction, an unbelievable sense of brain chemistry that quickly moves from the brain all the way, as we know it at times of great terror and anxiety in our lives, it can move swiftly through our whole body in what feels just like a nanosecond. We can go from being calm to being terrorized. And it depends on what it is that has happened and how active our imagination may be and what our history might be and what the threat might be. That can cumulatively create an unbelievable biological reaction. And we call that, whether we always name it this or not, fear when we stop to think about what it is that's really happening. It has many, many different faces, and what I want to do tonight in part is to explore some of those different faces because it can look really quite different. It can play differently in our emotions, in our mind, in our bodies, in our relationships, and in our world. So let me first begin by just having you do a little exercise with me. We're not going to turn to our neighbor and share our greatest fear. I, I thought about maybe opening in that way, but thought maybe that wasn't quite the first question that we should ask. So for the moment, I want to just take maybe, uh, you know, 30 seconds, a minute or so to have you just let your mind go to the places where you think you know the experience of fear. Might be past, present, might be some anticipation of the future. So now let's just be quiet and just sort of think in our own minds, bodies, what are the places where we have experienced fear? Now let's move it a little more broadly. If you were to think about places in the world or habits or circumstances or patterns of culture, forms of, of change perhaps that causes fear, now let's do the exercise in a little broader way, not just our own personal fear, but what about the fear that you think is around you in the culture? What are some of the forms of that? What are the places that you think, the kind of signals of fear? As we think about that list, and I would venture to guess that it's a pretty vast list, that we quickly can start totting things up, right? It's not just usually a single experience. It's not just a single place, either in our own story or in other people's stories. It's really, uh, it's an experience that we share in a way, but fear can also be one of the most intensely isolating experiences of our lives, where we may feel fear when no one else is afraid, or we don't know that anyone else is afraid, but we feel so consumed by fear ourselves that we're just simply not sure what to do with it. I want us to think theologically and historically and uh, experientially a bit tonight about some of the lenses around fear, and then I want to have us particularly zero in on what I think the Bible gives us as, as the primary 
in a way, antidote or tool by which to understand our fears and to manage our fears in ways that are going to be productive and life-giving to us and to the people that are around us. So first of all, just sort of speak out a little bit if you would. What are, what are some just areas of fear? When you hear the word, what, it, what kind of categories of life, experience, places in the world, whatever. You don't need to now uh, tell us your own personal fear, but what are examples of fears that you immediately think of? Okay, Hurricane Harvey. Anyone else in the room have that fear? Okay, yes. Excuse me, war. Okay, right. Crime, okay. Violence, perhaps, as a general category. Cancer, Cancer sorry. Financial fears, right, exactly. Dying. Dying. Say that again. Houston streets. Sometimes fear has a very specific location. Yes. Other things. Excuse me? Parenting. Parenting. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we could do a whole evening on the fears as a parent. Yes. Let's get in biological touch with that. Yes, we've got some parental fears. What other things? Excuse me? Terrorism. Terrorism. Yes, absolutely. Sorry? Health and wealth issues. Okay, very important. Other things? Technology. Technology. Interesting. Right. Other categories? Excuse me? Yes, right. Others? People that are different than us, right. Loss of freedom. Rate of change. Schools, okay, right. Other things? Traffic, Traffic yes. Failure. Failure, thank you. Fear of speaking. Fear of War on Christianity. about fears are in our bodies they're in our histories they're in our stories they're they're in the story of the bible you can't not read the bible without reading it in part as a book about fear it's about healthy fear and destructive fear confusion that that can breed fear power that can breed fear power that's healthy can breed fear but power that's destructive can breed fear there's all kinds of issues one of the ways that i think uh, this has been framed in my mind has been <clears throat> when we lived in Northern California, I used to try to go and spend a day in what I would call in a classic California way, granite therapy. I would drive across the state to Yosemite and I would spend a day just kind of meditating on the granite faces of Yosemite Valley. I hope that many of you have had an opportunity to see uh, Yosemite. If you haven't, it's worth whatever it takes to get to Yosemite. It's one of the most amazing places I can think of. When you, you sit in front of granite, for a day, uh, some of the things that immediately occur to you are at, this, at the core of why we are fearful. Because what you're aware of when you're looking at granite is it turns out that granite has very little in common with me. I am short-lived, unlike that granite. I'm soft-bodied, unlike that granite. So the phrase rock-hard abs that some athletes use, that's only ever a metaphor. Even people who think they have rock-hard abs, it's not, they're not granite abs. They're, they're just rock-hard abs. They're harder than other abs, but they're not like granite abs, okay? So short-lived, soft-bodied. It's also sh um, short-statured, right? I'm, I'm so much smaller than, the, than just a granite face. This Yosemite Valley is not to be in the face of of one of the great mountains of the world. It's just a rock face. It's just that it's so gigantic compared to, to uh, a, a, a human size. Often when you sit there looking at the granite face, you're realizing, of, in other words, all the vulnerabilities, all the things that I'm short-lived, I'm soft-bodied, I'm soft-tissued, I'm small-statured, I'm, I'm this, this very, very vulnerable creature in a world where there are real dangers. There are such things as real threats. Now tonight, in talking about this, I'm not wanting to be a trigger for anyone, and I realize that even talking about fear can be fear-producing. That's not my desire. I didn't uh, have the hope that you would come here and leave feeling terrorized, but I do have to name uh, the things that, that are part of this. And part of it is just acknowledging that part of the reason we feel so much fear is that we are vulnerable in the world. You can't actually f create a world for your children to be free of danger. You can't create a world where everything will go well. You can't create a world where there's no disease. You can't create a world where there's no, uh, there's no injustice, where there's no sense of, of uh, violation, where there's not real threats from inside us 
and around us. Those are the, the terms. Now, I think this is what moves us then into the biblical narrative, and I'm going to say a little bit about that, and then we'll broaden the story a bit. In the biblical narrative, the thing that makes the creation of our lives so amazing is, of course, right at the very beginning in Genesis, when we have this amazing picture of a God who speaks the world into existence, and then in Genesis 2, a God who fashions the world by taking the dust and breathing life into us. This is not a picture of of a world or an experience of life that is foolproof from, from vulnerability. No, we are dust, and as the text will say to us later, and to dust we shall return. There is, there is an inevitability of our vulnerability, which God has built into our design. So we are, we are not the iron man. We are not the automaton. We are soft-bodied, short-lived, small-statured people who live as those kinds of people. And in that world, God says that we are not only good, but very good. This is God's intent. Yet what we have to live with then is this experience of of being created in a very vulnerable way. And where God's best design would be to say, but here's how I would create the world. I create it for a thriving communion in a world of great freedom where people would, by their own choice, do good and where in the attention of God's love and the surrounding community of human companionship that there will be well-being. That's sort of the, the picture that's given to us in the opening chapters of Genesis, right? This sense of a thriving, safe reality. You don't get any sense of danger when you read Genesis 1 and 2. But by the time you get to 3, okay, now we're into a different terrain. The story that began so well with all the ingredients of well-being, of security, of safety, of joy, of pleasure, of beauty, all of those things are in various ways now suddenly threatened. And the way the story unfolds in the garden is of course in this kind of tendency, which is part of our fear, a, a willingness to believe a lie. So the tempter comes and says, did the Lord say to you that you shouldn't eat of any tree in the garden? Well, actually that's not what was said. So deception becomes a part of what distorts our comprehension. And a great deal of the challenge of managing our own fear is always this question of is it real or is it unreal? Is it a real danger, a real threat, or is it a distortion that's come about as a result of something that might be imagined, right? This is where our own capacity to imagine the world can often create greater fears than the, even, than the real fears that are actually before us. This is one of my great dangers. I have let's just say, a hyperactive imagination. (laughs) I can dream richly in all kinds of ways that sometimes are very wonderfully positive and life-giving, but I can also dream in ways that are very scary and really threatening to me. And I have to then go through a process, sometimes with colleagues, sometimes with my wife, sometimes with our children. Let's get clear about what's really happening. Actually, that's really hard sometimes because life is complicated because the world that we live in isn't always what it appears, because there's always shadings of various things. And you have to figure out what are you going to trust and what aren't you. Max Dupree, who was a very, very significant influence on Fuller Seminary and was the chairman of Fuller's board for many years, the the CEO of the Herman Miller Company, used to say that the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Well, I would suggest the first responsibility of a person that's trying to live with fear in the world is to define reality. So what is real? What is actually real? Not what's imagined, not all the things that could be, but what's actually real. I think that's at the core of the affirmation that I think we're going to weave through the rest of our time in this, which is to think about the affirmation that's made many times in the Bible, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the language and phrasing of the Bible, That is the greatest single statement of how to define reality. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So is there going to be fear? Yes, but does the Bible say, let the fear of the Lord be the fear that is in a way the thing out of which all other fear is calibrated. Let all of reality be defined by the reality of God. And that's what drives us back in the Bible over and over again to asking who is this God? What is this God like? What is this God's character? What is this God's intent? What are the purposes of God? How does God act? What is it it that God has created? What is that creation for? What are the limits and boundaries of what is going to be healthy and and unhealthy? 
And it's in that context of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom that we begin to get a handle. Let me unpack that just a little bit. I'm sure that that phrase is known to you, but it's often really distorted. So just even sometimes using the phrase, the fear of the Lord, is almost thought of as a kind of adequated phrase, a phrase that was part of, as it were, quote, old time religion, a kind of um, you know, vision of a God uh, who is hounding us and calling us into kind of a broken, terrified fear, a trembling before God. That is not the primary image at all that's given uh, in the Bible of what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord in the Hebrew scriptures is really to have a right understanding, a right ordering of reality in light of who God is. Let God, in God's actual reality, help set the stage for how you understand the world. See, the way that we start our lives is that, of course, we're born, we're come into the world, we are come into whatever home, family, healthy, unhealthy, whatever that, that family's fears are, those are all part of the cluster bomb of things that we're invited into. We're nurtured in that in our homes for better and for worse. And in the context of that experience, we gain various perceptions, which may give us a radically difficult and even distorted vision of who God is. But the language of the fear of the Lord in the scriptures is to say, have a clear and true understanding of who God is. Let that be actually the ground of your life. And then let the ground of who God is, the God who has shown to us over and over again in the Bible is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of compassion, a God who knit us together in our mother's womb, a God who is with us from dust to dust, a God who holds us in life and death and life to come, that God that holds the whole great narrative, that God, a God of mercy, a God of compassion and grace and justice, that God who seeks your welfare and the welfare of the world and promises to bring all things to their consummation, it's that God that the, that the scriptures say over and over again, let the fear of that God fill your heart and your mind as you think about what is. So the first plank of tonight is to say, how do we manage our fear? Have a very clear and growingly clear picture of who this God is. So much of what terrifies us, I think, is that we still feel naked without God, without neighbor, without friend, without ally, without protector. If we really actually understand what the Bible is saying about the character of God and the, the faithfulness and mercy of God, that gives us a very significant uh, way of recalibrating reality. Let that be the starting point. And if it starts in the Old Testament scriptures, of course it becomes even more personalized and deeply formative in the New Testament. If we imagine the companionship, the insight, the wisdom, the, the mercy and kindness of Jesus toward us and toward our world and our neighbors, we begin to have a really different calibration of danger. Also, if we think about God's power, the power that is really above and beyond any other kind of power, so the central Christian confession is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, if Jesus Christ is Lord, what that is saying, among other things, is that there is no power in heaven and earth that is any greater than the power of Jesus Christ. Now, we might confess that. We might feel obligated to stand at a moment when we recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or something else to say that, but that tonight we're not thinking about how do we make this a confession. We're talking about how do we make it a text that is written on our hearts, right? A sense that it's sunk into our bones. That's a long process of Christian maturity. And our fears give us the opportunity to grow in that, right? So as fears arise, the scriptures, I think, would call us to say, how do we turn toward God with the reality of those fears in all of their rawness before a God who knows everything about us and about the world and find in that God a God who, who frames and holds the terror of the night, the anxiety of our dreams, the, the fears that we have about our future, our health, our children, our grandchildren, the world, and on it may all go. Do we believe in the God who actually holds us in good times and in bad? That's a that's actually a profound theological question that's not at the level of abstraction. It's really all the way down on the ground. Does it actually matter to us that my life is held by a God of that kind of mercy and love and justice? We'll come back to that theme. So the big fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible, as you know, is, a, is really not an, an idea. It's not an, an old man sitting in a chair uh, offering epithets that we should uh, memorize and consider. 
Wisdom in the Bible is really the truth and character of God lived in context. It's when all of those things align. The character of God is wisdom, the truth and character of God. It's always lived, it's not just an idea, it has to be a practice. And it's lived in context. So the book of Job is one of the great challenges to this. Job's friends, as you know, are really good at rolling out all the reasons why Job, it must be in the wrong if he's had all these bad things happen to him. And they're trying to help him say, you just need to come back to wisdom, confess that you've done everything wrong, and God will make things right. And then Job keeps saying, but I haven't done anything wrong, and you're not really understanding what I'm calling to. I'm calling out to a God who who understands my questions and my tyrannies and my fears and my frustrations and my anxieties and my sense of injustice, and I'm needing to live it out in the context now of having been stripped of all the blessings that I thought were the evidences of God's protection. Job is a fascinating book to study around these themes of fear, so let me commend Job to you, because it's a book that really invites us into very deep spaces around what do we really do when it feels as though our fears about God, our fears about each other, our fears about the natural world can come against us. And the book of Job, I think, is there to say, here is what God does in response to that. He welcomes our terrors. He welcomes our honest, and ultimately, in Job's case, enraged feelings of how terrifying and disappointing and confused he is in the face of that. God welcomes that ultimately. And though at the very end of the book, he will call Job into account, he does it in dignity. It's, his jo- it's Job's friends that have the judgment fall on them. It's Job who's restored. Why? Because I think he lived his fears honestly and faithfully before God. He was practicing the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. He was actually l- starting there and demanding, in that case, that God come right with his promises. Now, if, if that is a framework, and we're gonna come back to that so this becomes an, a more practiced idea, we have to think then, well, what are some of the experiences of fear that we have? And let me just give you some examples of categories uh, that, are, that are, at least to me, very important to keep in mind. Let's start in an unexpected place. Do you know that we're a culture that's actually sort of addicted to fear? right? You, I'm sure are aware that uh, there's things that we hate about fear, but it turns out that we also sort of love fear because part of the biochemistry of fear is that it creates this flashpoint of, of adrenaline and of capacity to actually engage, right? Because part of the gift of, of fear is the ability to avoid danger, right? So that's a, that's a kind of a stimulating thing that can happen in our lives. But then there's also this other side of the biochemical reaction of fear that can settle in in a way that feels like surge and release. Surge and release. This is partly why people become addicted to many kinds of things that are fear-inducing. Let's start with, um, with going to amusement parks or haunted houses or gaming. A lot of gaming is about the surge of fear and arresting, the surge of fear, and then the satisfaction of the danger passing. That addiction, extreme sports, another example of a form of entertaining, adrenalized fear. I wanna max out my fear. The popularity of a show like The Walking Dead, the producer of The Walking Dead happens to be somebody that I know, and she has said the fascinating thing about producing this program, which has been uh, for a number of years one of the most popular and most watched television programs. How many of you, do any of you watch The Walking Dead? I bet it's partly a generational thing. <laughs> yeah, let me just say, uh, you know, I'm sort of in the camp of people in the room, but believe me, uh, you know, it is one of the most watched television programs. And why? Because it's fearful, because it's scary, because it's uncertain. And you, you, have, you have it and you don't have it. So you're watching it on a screen, but the visual is extremely powerful. It entices people and they come back week after week for another surge of anxiety, followed by another p- moment of release, right? It's an amazing uh, sort of dynamic. So, on the one hand, we actually are fear lovers, not just fear haters. Our life and our lives, our relationships, our ideas are somewhat more complicated. But the great fear that often has been thought to be the greatest fear, of course, is the fear of death. Ernst, Ernest Becker wrote a classic book called The Denial of Death, saying in response to Freud that the primary thing that defines our life is not uh, a sense of projection of God, but re- or an anxiety about some, something in relationship to our own sexuality, but actually instead a fear of death. That's the primary thing that actually defines our life. 
And it's certainly the case that we can think of all kinds of fears that are specifically around fear of death. Disease is one of those, but what are some other examples of, of expressions of fear that are related specifically to a fear of death? What would be other illustrations of that? Excuse me? Aging, absolutely, yeah, aging. What other things? Loss of independence, very significant, yep. Falling, yes, right. Losing capacities of different kinds. Loss of dignity, right. Often a loss of voice, a loss of full weighted voice. Many people that I've known as a pastor over the years have said as they get older, they have a sense that they're actually disappearing, that they're less seen, that they're less acknowledged, that they're less trusted. It's an amazing picture of a kind of vanishing. And that, in all of its constellation, it can be a fear of, of death related to not, wanting, not being able to see your, your children or your grandchildren grow up, or that you're not able to have certain experiences or be with certain people, or... A, a, create a kind of environment that you've been a part of for many, many years, achieve some of the things that you want to achieve. This exists on so many different levels, and we have a lot of, of very involved ways of trying to cope with this. So you take the fear of aging. Um, one of the things that defines a place like, like uh, Korea is in particular their great desire to, to not appear to be aging. So people come from all over the world to Korea in order to have the trifecta your neck, your eyes, and your, what would it be, your forehead or something, I've forgotten what it is, some other part of your body, um, of your face, and, uh, and it's, it's, and Korean friends have often said to me, one of the things that, that they experience very deeply in that context is that, but the same thing is true, just come to LA, let's come, let's, the stereotype of people that live in LA compared to the people who live in Orange County is the rate of, of surgeries that are done in order to undermine any suggestion that anybody might think that you're actually getting older even though time is passing. So there's an elaborate way that we lie to ourselves and that we uh, want to feel good about ourselves and we do all kinds of things, much of which is, is obviously completely neutral in any uh, theological or spiritual sense, but it is a story to us about what it is that we're fearful of. Where are we afraid? I know, certainly know in my family one of my mom's greatest fears, period, was her, that she would get Alzheimer's and she died of Alzheimer's. She had Alzheimer's for eight years, and it was a mercy to us that she, once she started into her uh, sort of spiral, it was for her an extremely fast spiral. So she went from being fully functioning, no evidences of Alzheimer's, to about six months later, uh, being in a period where she was completely outside of, of the or normal operating world of, of, that we were all in, and she stayed in that place for another seven and a half years. That was terrifying. It was relieving to us that, that while this was happening, she could feel the anxiety of, of seeing what was happening. And I was, I, my brother and I were so relieved when it was clear that she had sort of hit the end of that part of the road because now she was no longer aware of it. And her last seven and a half years, as much as they were disconnected in many ways mentally, she was really still herself. And our presence with her and her with us was actually very, meaningful, but it was not the same person, right? It was a sign of genuine, it's that fragileness, short-lived, soft-bodied, small-statured, right? Those are, those are real things. Now, how, how do we hold something like mortality? So, let, let, I'll give you my understanding of this, but as you face a fear of mortality, we face this fear in common, we all have this in common. What is helpful to you in facing the fear of mortality? Faith? In what? Okay, so eternal life, a sense that this narrative is not the, the end of the story. Right. That is a piece of the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. What else would it be? Yes. Right, so, so as the road unfolds and eternity hasn't yet arrived, God is still with me in that long journey. Okay, very, very important. Was that, yes? It's just not focusing on it all the time. Right. Focusing on your current life. Right, 
So what's happening in that? that so the, she's saying one of the things that can be a help is realizing this isn't the total picture of who I am. I'm an aging person, but that's not the story of my whole life. That's a piece of my life, but it's not the whole story of my life. Part of what fear does, especially fear that's distorted in fear, is that it can, and, and it, this can happen when fear is very positive, it can happen when fear is, is uh, problematic, is that it rivets the mind, right? And th if that becomes our obsession, then our whole focus is trying to overcome that particular fear. It just turns out you're not gonna be able to overcome the fear of dying, meaning that will be a fear that we will have to live with. We all will have to live with that in some way. It can become an obsession, right? So uh, there's a place in Northern California uh, called the Winchester Mystery House, and it was lived in by a woman who was a kind of spiritist, and the f hilarious and bizarre and sad thing about going to the visit this house is that her theory was that as long as, sh she believed that as long as she kept building on this house, she wouldn't die. So, uh, so the theory was if she could just keep carpenters busy, then she would be protected. Well, this of course was a distortion of reality. This is called not living in the fear of the Lord. This is called living in a alternate universe where, <laughs> where she actually had a completely distorted view of what was going on. It turned out she did actually die even though her house was being built. She left a fascinatingly bizarre house, which I would commend to you to go visit sometime because it's the story of fear. That house is the story of fear. And a person that had means to build on it forever, thinking if they did it, they would keep away from death. It doesn't happen that way. So since we all are on that road, how do we meaningfully go down that road? How do we bring dignity to that road and, and proportion to the road, rather than uh, letting the road of death be the total story, which it isn't? Other things, what other kinds of things do we do to face the fear of mortality? Any other examples? I think it's called medicine. So one of, the things, one of the things that we do is that we get to live in a world where there's things, something called medicine. We l are glad about that. We, I hope, uh, have the opportunity to go and take advantage of seeing the doctor, of having access to medications, of being able to be treated for things that are really quite treatable, to not die needlessly because of the lack of, of uh, access to healthcare. All of those kinds of things become ways of saying this is really a, a quite legitimate thing to think about how we live our lives. So mortality. Now the, the thing is that we never get to live this out very much, at least in isolation. We have to live it in a community. It's usually called our family. Sometimes it's a circle of wide, a wider circle of people. And I would say one of the great gifts of being a pastor, one of the things I strangely miss the most about being a pastor is walking with people through the final chapters of their lives. That for me as a pastor was one of the, my favorite parts of being able to be a pastor. It sounds a strange thing to say, uh, especially if you haven't been a pastor, but it, it's not macabre. It's actually some of the most honored experiences of being a human being that I can even imagine. Why? Because they've taught me so much about what it means to live and to die, right? I, I have an image, a story, a set of stories of people that have died in ways that are so varied. No one's death is like anyone else's death. And it's all a personal journey. But I know that my own sense of mortality has been deeply positively shaped by people whose life and death has been so honorably, faithfully, honestly lived, right? So not free from pain always, not always free from other challenges and issues, but out of that, the presence of God in the midst of a process of a person's dying can be some of the most uh, amazing parts of people's lives. And so though I have walked with probably four or 500 people to their dying moments, I now see that, I think, through the fear of the Lord in the sense that I see what it's like for God to hold each life with such value and meaning and uh, worth in, in all the questions and doubts of that season, in the times when families are still working out their family stuff in the course of the dying process, when forgiveness really sometimes does happen on the deathbed, when there really is resolution that can happen if you are willing to die honestly. But if you're just absorbed with your fear, then really, in a way, as strange as it may seem, you can't make the most of your dying. That may sound like a very strange thing to say, but I, can, I have observed it over and over again. The ability to be honest in our dying so we get to name our fears. So tonight is partly the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
Let that be the thing from which all other fears are calibrated. And when we face the greatest fear, or potentially the greatest fear that we might have, which is the fear of death, there is a God who actually is more than sufficient for that fear, who understands all of its terrors, who has made us as dust, who brings us uh, through life and will bring us to our death and holds us in eternity. That is, that is an amazing portrait of a God who then gives us in understanding, in companionship, in presence, in family, the kinds of resources that can be with us in that. Now here's an interesting statistic. We say that, and yet when studies are done about medical care in America, one of the interesting ways that this has been broken out in some of the research is what are the spending habits of people on the way in the last two months of life? And it turns out that counter to what you might anticipate, the people that are most prone to spend the most amount of money in the last two months of their life for the sake of their own preservation are Christians. Now, there's all kinds of ways we could reflect on that, but you could anticipate that it might be the opposite, right? You could anticipate that maybe Christians would feel that with an assurance of, of the fact that God holds them in the fear of their death, that they actually are less prone for life-extending things to be done. Instead, it's sort of the opposite, that there's a significant disproportion of Christian spending, p- people who are self-identified Christians who spend toward the end of their life to make sure that their life is extended rather than released. I'm just gonna let that just be with you tonight. I'm not trying to <laughs> overreach that. I'm just saying, I just find that really interesting. What does that say to us about how we understand our mortality? and whether we do or don't really allow a God of eternity to really meet us in the face of that fear. But let's choose another fear. Let's move to an entirely different thing. We mentioned earlier the fear of uh, the parents carry. So what are some of the fears that parents carry? Oh, let us count the ways. What are, <laughs> what are, the, what are the fears that parents, survival would be one thing. First, let's just say that our children would survive. What other things? that they would be happy, there'd be a sense of well-being in their life, right. Stay out of trouble, trouble, right. Their health, right. Faith in their Lord. Yes, right, (laughs) right, (laughs) exactly. Those special teen years. I've often said uh, when when our two boys were in their teens, I would just kind of quietly uh, put my hands on their head and not say it out loud, but just pray for full brain development. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like two boys, come, come frontal cortex, come, <laughs> come fully developed brains who are going to actually be able to like cope with the totality of the world. Like that was a, a very big thing to me. It did, yes. They, well, I, actually, I only can say that brain, full brain development doesn't happen until 25. I have a 23-year-old and a 29-year-old. But that 29-year-old has full signs of full brain development. We're still <laughs> hoping for that final closure with the 23-year-old. Other, other things that you think of? Financial success or security, whatever that might mean. Yeah. The spouse, right. Yeah. Right, right, it, a fear of are you really parenting them well? Is this really actually the right way to parent them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, this is so many pressure points, right? All of these are, are triggers of fear in different ways. They don't, they're not like the fear of fire, they're not like the fear of, of you know, a car accident, though that is associated sometimes with parenting, but it's the fear of, of this life that has actually been entrusted to you, or these lives, and what it means to actually nurture them in their uniqueness, in their demands, their peculiarities, if, if the child has any kind of special needs, the particular things that that may raise, this, the issues that might happen in how they relate to one another. Um, we have two boys, they're six years apart, and certainly when the youngest son arrived, the oldest son was six years old, and he's always at that stage, especially in his early childhood, really did not entertain fools gladly, and he early decided that his little brother was definitely the arch fool. So that created then, a dynamic that really became a real dynamic in our family. How do we help our older son to understand this is not actually the fool, this is called your brother, and you do actually uh, have responsibility for encouraging him and not just, as it were, um, doing other things to him, which 
uh, he was ready to do. So, and there were fears about that, right? That's, that's a longitudinal fear. That's not just a fear for a given moment. That's a fear over a season, a set of practices. So coming back again to the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does that mean that we bring to our parenting? If we're gonna let not the whole solution but the orientation of our fears be defined out of our faith, what does that bring to the task of parenting? Well, to me it brings in part the task that this child has been nurtured and created by God, that no one knows or loves this child any more than, uh, than God himself does. God knows the nuances of their personality, has created them in their uniqueness. I realized in that season with, of tension between our two sons that one of the things that I learned was that my parenting style toward our older son really began to change because he was also changing as all this was unfolding, right? It wasn't just the arrival of a, of a little brother. He was also now in first grade, second grade, third grade. He was beginning to emerge into a new social reality that was beyond our family. His world was changing. I needed to understand that. And fortunately in this case, a few years into that, it suddenly had, I had this experience where I felt like I was getting nowhere with him. I had great anxiety about what I saw was happening. And what I saw was that actually if I spoke to him in a really soft voice, he was unbelievably attentive. Now that would not have been my strategy. <laughs> Fear spiked my interest in controlling my son in order to get him to do the thing that I believe should happen. So it was instinctive to me to actually use a louder voice when I suddenly discovered through an accident really that when I talked really quietly, he was immediately attentive. We had lots of very important, almost whispering conversations. And it was like, unbelievable. The volume gets turned down, the hearing goes up, the capacity to be in communion with each other grew rather than actually broke. Where did that come from? I think it came in part for me through this accident of discovering that difference for him, which is true even to this day. But it's also that I realized he is his own unique person, absolutely distinct, so unlike our other son, unlike me, unlike my wife. Both of our boys are adopted. That means that whatever intuition that you think you might have as biological parents, and plenty of biological parents have said to me, they're biological and I still don't understand them. But it's also true that when your children are adopted, you also think, I, yeah, but I don't, I don't know what, who they are in, this, in the way that I think I might if they were biological children. Well, it certainly caused my wife and me to realize that we have to be highly attentive. We have to lean toward the uncertainty. Let's walk into the fear. In those early years, uh, I, I came into a friendship that has meant a lot to me. And in this one family uh, that had children, roughly our children's ages, they had a strategy for fear that was really quite important in nurturing their children. And it was what they call charge the darkness. So you know that uh, most children, as young children, have an anxiety about uh, the dark and monsters or things that might happen in the dark in whatever way uh, uh, Shel Silverstein or someone else might have written about it. And, and so they decided to develop a family strategy was to, which was to say, let's teach our children to be people who know how to charge the darkness. So are you fearful? We really understand fear. It's really understandable that you could be afraid and certainly that you would be afraid of the dark. That's not, we, we, we all have fears in, in the dark in various ways. And we could talk about that. But what they did as a family is that they had a little practice called charging the darkness. So the child that had the, the fear or the nightmare or whatever it would be, would be surrounded by the family and they'd have a great big family hug. And all of this was about, we're embracing our fears. This is sort of the lesson of the family. Instead of protecting them from the fear, it was helping them to assert themselves toward the fear. So first they would have a great family hug. Then uh, the oldest person in the group, usually one of the two parents, would charge the darkness first. So they, if it was in the room where the darkness was, then the father or the mother would charge into the darkness and sort of devour the room and look all around and say, and come back out and say, I've been everywhere, there is nothing there. Then in sequence, everyone in the family would go in and charge the darkness. And this created an amazing family culture that said, you know what we do? We have really scary things and we go for it. We go into the darkness, we don't avoid the darkness. Now, this was just like revolutionary to me. This was not the instinct of my family. My, the instinct of my family was, um, was protection, it was security, it was reassurance, but it wasn't courage. So part of what happened for us and our family was an acknowledgement that as we watched this other family, we realized, oh my gosh, so why would they do that? Well, because of really a God who says, charge the darkness. That's one way of defining what it means to be people who live with faith. 
It's part of what it means to follow a, a God who does risky, unexpected things, who invites us into an adventure of discipleship that doesn't fit anybody's script, that's actually gonna walk toward evil, not just away from evil, that's going to try to do justice, not just try to avoid injustice. So if we're gonna raise children with those instincts, well then we should start early, helping them absolutely accept their fear, learn from their fear. Maybe there really is like a unbelievably gigantic monster under the bed. And if there is, we're going to deal with the monster under the bed. But if it turns out there's not a monster under the bed, then we're not going to let the, the supposed monster under the bed control our life. So they would charge in and have this whole experience. And then they sort of have a little party, like we charge the darkness, it's clear, we're all set. And if it was needed, they would sometimes do it two or three times in a, a given night. And over a period of time, they found that their kids became encouragers to one another to face scary, dangerous, fearful things. We have to ask ourselves, what, what's the culture, subculture, family, church, neighborhood, friends, circle that we're in? There's a lot in the American church that I think is a distortion of the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom has sometimes in the American psyche of church attenders especially, is a God of protection and safety, a God of security. Well, that's true. That is a, a major part of what the Bible suggests. But another part of what the Bible suggests is a God of, uh, of renovation, a God of turbulence, a God of disruption, a God who's going to make all things new, a God who's not about to be stopped by challenges or dangers or fears. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're, if we're going to be people who nurture courage as a Christian virtue, then how do we help people, children and others, learn about what it means that the, beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom that gives us strength and capacity to actually be able to move into the darkness, toward the fear, not just away from the fear. That instinct, I would want to suggest, would radically change the American church. If the American church was defined more by its call to courage than by its desire for security, though the two things are interconnected, so I'm not suggesting that we want one without the other, but if it was principally defined by courage rather than security, I think the nature of the gospel in America and beyond well, I dare say be quite different than if it was really about protection and security as our primary way of dealing with fear. Let me move to a different category. We all know that there's a great deal of social challenges that are going on in the world. Immigrants, people of color, violence in America in the streets, various kinds of highly contested issues uh, that people are debating and people are swirling around in different ways. And in the context of that, there's a great sense that our sociology, our vision sociologically, is defined less by a God who's created every human being in, their, in God's image, but more by the sociology of our own background, the particular class that we're from, the kind of race that we have, the sort of social circumstances that we're in, the economic reality that frames us. All of that can be a way of creating a reality which can be freer from many of the fears than people who do not have that set of privileges. So you take away the security of economics or of, of race or of class or of education or of means in various ways and suddenly you're living in a very, very different reality. So I think of students, for example, at Fuller who have grown up in very poor homes, people who have often been in circumstances racially where they've been minority populations, where there's been a tremendous sense of physical danger where it may have been true in their home or it's been true in their neighborhood, it's true in the way that, uh, as was demonstrated recently, even going into a Starbucks where suddenly just being black became an occasion. Now, for those of us who are in this room, most of whom uh, are Caucasian, I think it's very difficult for us to understand what that social reality of, of being a person of color in America can actually feel like. And I know, as well as you do, all the way that this can become such a highly charged thing and the way that it becomes something that is uh, that's a, an issue that people have political debates about. But I'm not talking about the political debates at the moment. I'm really just talking about the lived experience of what it means to be a person of color and the fears that some have that I don't have. I'm a tall, white, educated male. <laughs> that gives me freedom to not think about my height, to not think about my gender, to not think about my class, to be able to move in and out of settings with relative ease because that's the way the culture that I'm in a lot of the time works. But I don't know a person of color for whom their experience of being a person of color isn't for them in some point or points on any given day, if not on every day, an element of some degree 
of anxiety and fear, where the, the reality of being their particular racial background creates for them a, a fear, an anxiety, a darkness, a threat that's just a function of their skin. They're, they arrive as people made in the image of God, as you and I do, and they also, made in the image of God, arrive in the same circumstances, and they have a completely different social reality. I think it's really hard for, often, for people who are Caucasian in our culture to really understand how radically different that is. I hope that you have the privilege of, of significant friendships with people of color who don't share your same social reality. And I can just say from my own uh, friendships that the, the stories on ordinary days of just trying to do the most ordinary things, becoming issues, places of threat, danger, fearfulness of their physical safety, fearfulness of the, of the questioning of their character, fearfulness of their intent or purposes, an extraordinary reality of fear that many of us in this room have really never experienced, but which many, many other people in, in this area and in our nation and our world experience every single day. So part of what the Bible also suggests, I think, in the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It turns out that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not just for me, but for us, right? It's a collective statement. It's a statement about the church. It's about how we live and order our life together. It's a statement of how we're meant to turn toward places of danger in the world. So this is now our opportunity to think a little bit about what does it mean to charge the darkness. So what, it, what would it mean for you or for me to face some of our fears? So I want you to just think for a minute. When you think about social danger, the kind of people that to you feel threatening, fearful, anxious, uncertain, just sort of hold in your mind an image of, of what people like that are for you. Where do you go? And then what is that associated with? As you just quickly try to sort of do a mental tabulation about where, did that, where are those fears coming from? What would they be? What experiences have I had? What assumptions am I making? What's, what is actually true and what is just anxious? Right? If we go back again to the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, and we think about what it means to love our neighbor, the book that, uh, that was mentioned uh, a moment ago, The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor. Why would it be called that? Because <laughs> it just turns out that one of the reasons that we don't love our neighbors very well is that we are threatened by our neighbors. And we're threatened by neighbors that might be like us, but we're certainly threatened often by people, by neighbors who are not like us. And yet, the God of, of the Bible is a God who is about a friend-making God, a God who loves enemies, who, a God who is an enemy-loving God and says, I want you to follow me. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not a big deal if you just love those who love you. Even Gentiles, he said, can do that. So most of us in this room, could we, even we could love people who love us. But then Jesus says, yeah, but really the benchmark is, are you able to love those who don't love you, who don't like you, who are not like you? Are you able to love people who are your enemies? Okay, so let's imagine that's sort of the gold standard, enemy love. But let's imagine that along the way, that's too high a bar for us to immediately, we're not gonna wake up on Friday morning and decide, I'm an enemy lover, really, that's what I do every day. <laughs> I, I, just, I just find it the most natural thing to love enemies. Like, it's all done, got settled on Thursday night, they're right there at MDPC, we settled it, enemy loving, like, that's what I'm about. No, it probably isn't gonna happen like that, so maybe it'll happen over time. So, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we know that certain kinds of people are difficult for us to love, what if we began by not trying to go for necessarily loving enemies, but what if we started loving people who annoyed us? Do you know anyone who annoys you? <laughs> are, they, are they sitting next to you in the pew? <laughs> Have you come here tonight in order to avoid somebody who might annoy you? Isn't this partly why we, why we love uh, having caller ID on our phones, to be able to tag into people or not who might annoy us, right? So what if we became really good at overcoming our fear, which sometimes is true, of annoying people? Like, we're afraid they're gonna take too much of our time, too much of our energy, too much of our attention, et cetera. So what if we move then beyond that after we've practiced that for a while into loving people who really irritate us, okay? This is a little more clawing action is going on where, where there's really a difficulty maybe in loving someone. I can think of some people in my world that are like that for me. In this process of being a person for whom the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we're following a God who says, I want to put you on a trajectory of becoming enemy-loving people. I want you to follow my example. I want you to face gradually, 
closer and closer, more and more directly, people who might be fearful for you. There was a woman in our church in Berkeley who, um, who was a kind of San Francisco socialite. She came to our church uh, in Berkeley every, really early, uh, on, and she went later explained to me why she came so early. And she said, really, I come really early so that I can park in that one spot so that I can then avoid the street people that are sometimes around the church. So if I park there, I can just quickly dart in and then I just sit and I wait for the service and it's easier for me that way. I don't have to feel fearful about encountering street people as I walk down the street. She said, you know, I've been coming to this church long enough to realize that maybe that's not exactly a full Christian life. Uh, maybe God wants more for me than just avoiding the street people. So she said, you know, I heard that there were these food coupons that could be given out. So, um, so I decided what I would do is I'd come early, I'd wear my track shoes so that I could, you know, run if I needed to. And I... <laughs> I would, I put my purse under my arm and I had my food chits in my hand and I would just sort of flick them as I walked up this certain street where there were a lot of, of people uh, hanging out on the street that were clearly without food and without homes. Um, and she said, I felt really good about myself, frankly. I felt really good that I was overcoming my fear. I was on the street where the homeless population was the highest. I was doing something good. I got into church. Everything was fine. She said, I did that for quite a while. And then I, she said, I realized that I didn't know anybody that was there. And besides, I'd noticed that there was one, this one particular guy that had caught my attention that I thought really actually might have some potential of getting off the street. So she said, this one Sunday I decided what I was going to do is that I was going to walk up the street, flick my little food chits along the way, and then if he was there, I had a $10 bill in my hand and I was going to give him a $10 bill. So suddenly she said, sure enough, I walked up the street, I flicked my little food coupons, suddenly there was the guy, I dropped the $10, I was quickly hurrying on and suddenly a voice standing right behind me said, hey, and I turned around and that very person was now enfolding me in a very long, aromatically rich embrace. <laughs> and in that setting, she said, this is exactly what I always feared. And then she said, are we done? And he said yes, and he dropped his hands. She quickly turned around, spun around, she said, and, and virtually ran back to the church. She said, I was standing there singing the opening hymn, and I'm thinking, I don't even know this guy's name. So she closes the hymnal. She goes back out onto the street. This guy has bought some food. He sees her coming. He jumps up, ready to give her another embrace. She said, no, really, that's, that's fine. I uh, appreciated your earlier hug, but now what I'm wondering about is um, I, didn't, I didn't really know your name. She told him her name. They had this exchange. They talked for a few minutes, and then she went back to church. She said, my heart was just beating, 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 because it felt to me like this was the thing that always caused me to come early so that I didn't have to have an encounter with somebody that I didn't know that might say or do or be something or smell in a way that I didn't want to cope with. And I quickly made my way back to the church. Then she said, the next, by the next Sunday, I was really actually hoping he would be there again. I had no idea what would happen if I saw him, but I decided I would greet him. I'd, I'd just call him by name. She said, I started doing that, and over time, what happened, she said, was that, that I always wanted to see him. I stopped giving him any money. I realized that was a distraction. That wasn't helpful to him, and it wasn't helpful to me. So that dropped away completely, but the conversation began to become important to me, and he introduced me to some of his other friends that were on the street, and really over the last several months, I've now become acquainted with maybe five or six different people that he hangs out with almost every week, and then they're connected to other people, so I now actually come early not to avoid the people that are on Telegraph Avenue, but to actually talk to them. She said, now a world that I had done everything possible to orchestrate myself up for avoiding has now actually become one of the most meaningful parts of my week. It lasts, she said, for maybe 20 minutes. This is hardly like I'm changing my whole lifestyle, I'm entering a different universe, but I'm facing my fear. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the path that she's on is a path now that's much richer than the path of avoidance. It's, in her version, charging the darkness. It's figuring out how do I step toward the place of anxiety, believing that the God who knows me knows them, the God who no understands this danger, is a God that isn't going to call me to throw my life uh, before a moving truck, but I could at least know someone's name. I could at least know something about their story. I could check in and see how their week was. It took 15 or 20 minutes. There was no, no worry, no fear. All of that dropped away, and she said, now it was just a relationship. 
I share that as we come to the close of this time before we have some open uh, Q&A for a few minutes before we're done. We'll be promptly done by 8.15. Um, just to say, when we think about fears, we have to think about our own. We have to think about the people that are around us that are in our closest circle. Perhaps our family is the starting point for that, or our closest friends. We need to be honest about all of our fears. We are, after all, small-bodied, soft-tissued, short-lived creatures with amazing fragility. So we need to acknowledge the, the real dangers. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is a launching pad, a place to orient, to calibrate all the other dangers and then to hold them in a different way that's not defined by my competence or power. It's not defined by the, my money or lack of it. It's not defined by my being tall, white, and male. It's not defined by my sociology. It's defined by the reality of God's love and mercy that wants to remake me right in the midst of my fears in order to do what the Bible says uh, about 123 times, do not fear. It's not because we, there isn't a place for fear, but there's a place for fear to be recalibrated. The fear that should primarily define us is a fear of God. Are we knowing God, seeking God, serving God, loving God, letting God be the definer of our fears, or are we going to let it be defined by culture, power, money, gender, political status, social opportunity? Or is it going to be defined by the God who holds all human life and life and holds our life and does it with love and mercy and, and gentleness to the glory of Jesus Christ? So let's pause there, and I'll make one other comment at the end, but what comments, questions, reactions uh, in any way that you might want to raise? What are the things that might have just been jogged for you in thinking about this? Yes. Okay, and so she's, she's describing hearing a speaker who says an enemy is someone whose story we do not know. That was absolutely true of this young man on the street, right? He seems to just be pure enemy, and it turns out he's, he's just not pure enemy. Yeah, very, very helpful. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes. Yes. Right. How do we reconcile our trust in God with our fearing of God? So again, my understanding of fear is not about terror. Uh, that's, I hope, not what you're going to take away. Um, what I'm understanding fear to me is the right understanding of who God is, which involves then an understanding of God's character, God's justice, God's righteousness, God's patience, God's mercy, right? All of those values. The fear of the Lord is to say, I'm, I'm dialing in with ever greater clarity a, a picture of the truth of who God is. That is to fear God and to live in light of that truth, to let that truth be the defining truth that shapes my understanding of reality. The question that often uh, your question is connected to, though, is the question that really has to peel open the anguish. What if I come to understand God and trust God and then I'm radically disappointed by God? where I have a fear that I thought that fear of the Lord had taught me that I should trust God in a certain circumstance. And then that very circumstance is the very circumstance that actually happens to me. This is one version of the problem of evil, right? If God is all good and all just and all powerful, uh, why then does evil exist? Why, why do we live in a world not, where there's not just fragility and power, but there's actually evil, where there's really wrong that can be done and where, where sometimes it seems to us God doesn't come through in the clutch. What happens in the face of natural disaster? What happens in the context of, of undistinguishable wrong that just comes because of random acts of violence, like someone driving down a sidewalk in a van or somebody who shoots in a certain context or whatever it might be, right? Where there's this sense of what happened to my understanding of God in that setting, sorry? Right. And he is independent of circumstances. And his goodness is above and beyond circumstances. And he said, can we live in this circumstances to put him in So she's making the point that, in the way that I was just suggesting, sometimes that way of talking can link God too closely to circumstances. And we attribute to various circumstances God's 
direct action. Here I would want to commend to you a book um, that has recently been written. It's become a New York Times bestseller. It's written by a woman who's on the faculty at Duke Divinity School. Her name is Kate Bowler, B-O-W-L-E-R. And the name of the book is Everything Happens for a Reason, dot, 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 and Other Lies That I Have Loved. <laughs> um, so this book um, is hilarious, it's painful, it's poignant, it's thrilling, it's exhilarating, it's beautiful, it's motivating, it's hysterically funny. Um, why? It's written by a woman who at 37 was diagnosed with fourth stage uh, cancer. She had, I think, a two-year-old child, uh, a flourishing life uh, professionally, uh, and a, certainly a flourishing marriage, um, a vibrant, vibrant, vibrant person in the world. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, all the way from the first moment to a total diagnosis of fourth stage cancer. And in this context, she's a, she's a scholar of the prosperity gospel. So, what makes this so fascinating is that here's this person who's now studying churches who are promoting a health and wealth vision of God, that the God that they worship is a God who only wants to provide health and wealth. She's now the arch paradigm of somebody who either has evil in their life, according to some people's uh, theologies, or it's an evidence of she's not yet praying seriously enough, or she has unconfessed sin, or etc. right? This collision then becomes, in the first case, some amazing scholarship, which she's written in another book, but then in a memoir, uh, not, I pray, her closing memoir, she writes this book called uh, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies That I've Loved. It is a remarkable book, and it really engages in this question of when we are deeply disappointed with a scenario of understanding God that we think is gonna mean that we're protected from certain things, that we're free from certain uh, dangers or realities that, that might occur, uh, what are we going to do about that? And I would just say that that's uh, the rec most recent book that I've read on the subject of how we understand how to deal with our disappointment with God. Yes? How would you describe the church or characterize So what's the description of a church that really practices the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom? Well, I mean, some of the words that come to my mind, and you undoubtedly have some that w would come to your mind, but to me, it's a church that is deeply uh, Christ-centered, a church that has a very vigorous theology of what God has done in identifying with our humanity, which is the amazing thing about the incarnation, that God actually enters our human life, and that God has faced and leaned into all of the places of danger which the Gospels so vividly portray, and invites the church to discover a God who actually can not only meet us in life, but can actually raise people from the dead. In other words, there's hope beyond even the greatest danger. If that vigorous, vigorous theology is there, and then it's worked into real social relationships, so this is, I think, the glimpse that we get in the early Gospels, especially in the book of Acts, where the church, in a very uneven way, and stuttering steps with a lot of success and plenty of failure, is trying to figure out what does it mean to actually trust God to fear the Lord in this way. Now that we're understanding that God is like what has been made known in Jesus Christ and where life and death is included in that. And if that's really happening, then what kind of honesty does it bring us to? And what kind of courage does it initiate? And what kind of freedom does it foster? And what kind of service does it lead to, right? I think those are the kind of qualities that actually then invigorate a church that says, I wanna live uh, in the context of a church that does practice the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, we're gonna commit ourselves to that, not to the wisdom of a culture that says this is what's wise, but actually uh, a wisdom that is made up of what God has revealed in the heart and mind of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. Imagine reading the Sermon on the Mount, which is really about risk and danger and uncertainty, and then saying that's, that's God's response to fear in the world. Live like this, live like salt and light, live like courageous people who are enemy lovers, live like people who know how to forgive and who are able to lay down uh, resentment, who are able to, to use their words to build up and not to destroy, right? That, those become the, the energies of what actually helps a church to flourish, I think, in the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It will happen in action, not just in affirmation. It's not something that we just say. It has to be how we live. view of the church from the world is, is often that we're fearful. Right. Um, so and sometimes I think those critiques are very true and sometimes I think they're overblown. Yes. Um, and I think perhaps you were at a gathering recently and, and we, you 
Right. And, and I wonder if that was addressed, and how does the church broadly, I'm speaking, you know, maybe the American church broadly, how, right. do, we, how do we start to repair that? Right. So one way of reading what's happening in the American evangelical church uh, right now is, a, is really a discussion at times uh, something much more vigorous than a discussion about whether or not our faith is really defined primarily by fear. And it certainly is possible to read many, many, many of the, of, of the actions of the church as signs of things that we do in order to protect us from danger of different kinds. It could be from inside the church, it could be from outside the church. And the question is really if there's a dynamic about uh, how we can practice the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom in a fear-based culture, which can be inside the church and outside the church, how do we actually do that? Am I catching the question right? So again, you know, this is where for me, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is such a helpful thing. Okay, let's start there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I look at a world like the one that we're in where there are re real dangers to, to the church, to a life of faith, politically, socially, economically, educationally, um, politically, lots and lots of dangers. Are any of those dangers greater than the power of Jesus Christ? No. Okay, let's, let, but then let's sit with that. So I sometimes, as an exercise, just to be very practical about it, I will sometimes, uh, I read several newspapers every day, and one of the things I really love doing in the morning is to take uh, the front page or random pages of some of these papers and say, quite mindfully, I read the story, listen to the evidence of danger, because almost every story, if you want to read it that way, is a story of how danger is being negotiated in some kind of way. And to pray, Lord, you are actually the one who sees that in the, in the clearest, most important way. You know what it's actually about. I know only what the reporter is saying. You see the people that are in the story, not just the deep, not just the kind of descriptions, but actually who they are. Give, give me, give us, give Fuller Seminary, give the community of people that I want to try to influence strength to be able to lean toward that place of anxiety, fear, uncertainty, danger. What would it mean for God's people to show up in that place with a different narrative? with a narrative that's not driven by anxiety, but is it really, it's not driven by scarcity. It's driven by the abundance of a God of love and mercy and justice who holds people in real pain and seeks the welfare of the stranger, the foreigner, the alien, who understands our human condition, right? I find that that exercise uh, done multiple times a week gives me a really different frame on the news. My heart rate goes down. <laughs> I'm not breathing as frantically as I might have been at the beginning of the exercise. I have a different picture of the world. I want to carry that into the world. And then the next step becomes, how do I become equally mindful of that with every person that I'm encountering, every social circumstance? How do I, how do I acknowledge the places where I feel anxiety? So as a leader, there's places where actually people expect me to lead. Wow. Uh, that's kind of a scary thing. I mean, there's times when being a leader is something I feel suited for, and there's other times when I think, I can't really believe that I'm doing this. And in those places, I have to actually acknowledge that, that that's actually really where I am. How do I ground myself in this moment with a sense of clarity about who God is, about who I am? I'm not showing up as God. It just turns out I get to show up as Mark. Okay, that's relieving. I'm not having to be more than I am. I just get to be who I am. So an exercise that I used to do with my family was to say, you know, in bre at breakfast time, what are we going to do today? People would say what they were going to do today. And then I would turn to our little dog and say, what are you going to do today? And he would always say that he was going to be a dog today. And then I would say to our family, now, let's just remember that he's the only one who's definitely going to fulfill his real identity today. <laughs> because what will happen is that we will be prone to live our days trying to be more than human, which is one of the great temptations of every day. I need to be more than I actually have been created to be the answer man, the perfect leader, the perfectly capable person, the omnicompetent, multifunctional one who shows up and only does good, right? That is sort of one scenario, totally fallacious, non-existent, and I'm not ever going to achieve that. It turns out I'm not called to be that. That's called sin of its own kind. I get to lay that down. But it's also the case, I have another temptation, to be less than human. I could decide to be degrading to myself or to the people around me. I could decide to be unfair or unjust towards someone. I could be a person unwilling to enter into somebody else's life and their framework, less willing to extend to them the dignity that I would hope they would extend to me. That's being less than human. Our tendency will be to go in one direction or the other. The calling, and I think this is what the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is about, is to say, actually, I just get to be human today. I get to be 
an ordinary person today. I have serious responsibilities, as you do, but it just turns out I'm not the answer man. I'm not the salvation of the world. That's a huge relief to you. It's a huge relief to me. But I get to bear witness to that. I get to calibrate my life as, as the ordinary human being that I am, a person of dust to dust, right? I want to live in that freedom. And I want to extend that gift to other people. So I'm not going to expect them to be more than, they're, than they are or less than they are. That all becomes to me a way of dismantling fear. So that's on an interpersonal level. On a systemic level, we have to ask what are systems that actually cause people to suffer, um, to be blind, to be fearful because of, of everything from social structures, economic realities, racial realities, gender realities. All of that is a, an abuse of power. What is Christian worship for? The other book that's called The Dangerous Act of Worship is a book about rightly ordering power. What is Christian worship for? It's meant to reorder us from a world of distorted power where we go in thinking our boss is God or the market is God or my bank account is God or my doctor's diagnosis is God. No, it actually turns out I come into Christian worship and I remember actually there's only one God and that God is a God of life and mercy and kindness who knows us and loves us and seeks to uh, change us, right? It's that sort of theme. I know that we're at the end of our time so I'm going to stop. Let me put, say this. I really believe that truly that the American church is it a crisis? I think it's facing a very serious crisis. And I think the crisis could be defined as much as any single thing by fear. And it's about whether or not we're fearing the right thing and in the right priority. So as a conclusion tonight, I want to lead us in prayer to ask that God would give us the capacity to ground our lives in the fear of the Lord, to be less distorted in our life and in our perspectives by the fears of other sources that have little, if anything, to do with the character of God or with the nature of the world or our neighbor and give us a new freedom and a capacity to love. Perfect love casts out fear. What is needed is a deep and profound evidence of unexpected love. But if the Church of Jesus Christ is cowering in fear, we have no capacity to exercise the freedom to love. If the church showed up free to love, that would be the evidence that the fear of the Lord is truly the beginning of wisdom. Let me pray for that for you and for me. Lord, we really acknowledge that these are uh, complicated days, that we feel our vulnerability, sometimes in a very deeply personal way. We have anxieties, fears in the middle of the night, monsters of different kinds. We feel it for ourselves and for the people around us. So we turn to you and we say, oh God, truly help us live into a life in which the fear of the Lord is the beginning of our wisdom, of wisdom itself and of our wisdom. Set us free by that wisdom and freedom from that fear, from the distorted fear, to live out of the right fear of you so that we can truly love in a world which needs the evidence of a God of unexpected mercy and kindness and justice, of transformation and beauty and celebration and hope and joy. Lord, these are the great fruits, and fear can cripple us at every turn unless we actually allow you to be a God who sets us free by the fear of you that is the beginning of life itself. Bless this church. Houston and beyond needs Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church to be a community that is not defined by fear, but defined by your great love and by your capacity to meet them in the midst of their anxieties and pressure points, to allow them to be people who are free as light and salt toward each other and to the world that's around us. Lord, we offer all this to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.